morning, everyone. Welcome to this Prativity and Robert Half quarterly economic update, part of our Tackling Tomorrow Today series for 2022. My name is Paul Middleton, and I'm joined here today by my colleagues from Prativity and our sister company, Robert Half. It's great to see you all here, um, especially to see some familiar names and faces coming up on the screen. Um, today, we're talking about the future of our UK economy and our global economy. Um, and I'm sure we won't be struggling for things to talk about in that sense. Um, the first time we spoke with John this year, it was back in March when UK inflation was forecasted to be just over 7% and UK growth was estimated to be just under 4%. That seems like a world ago um, and I think four chancellors ago as well. The consumer price index has now risen by almost 10% in the last 12 months. And although the OECD recently said the UK economy would grow by 4.4% this year, they predict we will contract by 0.4% next year, with only Russia's contraction of almost 6% being worse than the UK. So what does this hold for us? When can we expect some better news? What's going to happen to inflation, oil prices, fuel prices, gas prices, grain, interest rates? wages and what effect will the war in Ukraine continue to have? How will more rises by the Fed affect us and the global economy? And are we already tumbling into recession or are we already there? So the session today is about what that means for all of us day to day and the businesses we all work in, um, as well as looking at things like the markets and probably linked very closely to all our pension pots. So to answer all these questions, but more importantly, all your questions, I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. John Ashcroft. As some of you may remember from his appearances on our collaboration forum and previous versions of this economic forum, John specializes in economics, strategy and financial markets, working with professional firms, large corporates and small medium enterprises. He's the author of The Saturday Economist, his weekly blog published on a website of the same name that some of you may subscribe to discussing the UK and the world economy. And my my team will post a link to that in the chat if you wish to go and have a look. John specialises in viral modelling, and it's this combination of modelling and, and statistical fueled economics that has resonated with so many of you before. So we thought, given everything that's going on, it's quite timely to bring you an update on John's insights, perspectives, challenges, and normally his dose of optimism that goes with that. John will be presenting his thoughts using some slides. So if you have questions or comments while he's speaking, Please just post them in the chat and the teams in the in the uh, in the teams bar as we go. When he's finished, I'll be delighted for you to come off mute, ask John all those difficult questions, and please do that just by putting your hand up using the icon or physically um, put 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 your camera on and show me that you want to ask a question and I'll come to you. John will speak for about forty minutes, so we've plenty of time to ask questions after that. And I'd really urge you to get involved. Please, please ask questions. Be bold. Let us know your Thank thoughts you. as it's infectious. And ultimately, this is your forum. So please guide it wherever you'd like it to go. So with that all done, John, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. And over to you. Well, thanks, Paul. And good morning, everybody. It's certainly a fascinating time. And uh, there's much talk of recession. The Bank of England talking about are being already in recession. The OBR suggesting we're already in recession, but actually there isn't much evidence yet that we're in recession. A lot of evidence that we could be heading that way and badly, but we'll be looking at some of the issues affecting the UK economy, and we'll also be looking at the world economy, a quick whiz around the world before we focus in some detail on the UK. A lot of information this morning and a lot of um, heavy data, but if you bear with me, they were hoping to deal with so many critical issues. So. Thanks for joining me. I'm now going to pull up my share, uh, slide deck with a bit of luck with a few issues yesterday, but um, I'll then run through this slide deck and pick, you can pick up on the points you want to do as we go through. So as I say, we were looking at the world outlook and the UK outlook and a quick market summary uh, to close. So what we're looking at, as we said in the early part of the year, is lower growth with higher inflation, higher interest rates, higher taxes and higher borrowing. Not a great outlook and not a great recipe for growth. The global recession, well, not yet, but we're bracing for high prices, lower growth and higher rates. We've had a series of issues to contend with, the pandemic shock, the economic shock thereafter, 
the seismic shock of disruption to supply as the economy is recovered, and also the threat of war with the invasion of Ukraine now in full play. We talked in the past about the bear hug, Putin's move on Ukraine, meant that it came up against the NATO forces, Russia's budget of $50 billion, up against a trillion dollars from NATO and the services there. And that's why there's so much talk now about the Russians actually running out of munitions, that they're begging product from uh, North Korea and around the world, trying to meet this demand on their rapidly depleting resources. So we added global conflict and global tensions to the issue. But when we look at the latest IMF world growth forecasts, we've seen through the year, they've been reducing the prospects for growth. They talked about growth at the start of the year of 4.4% for the UK economy. That slipped to 3.6% in April. It slowed again to 3% in July. And the latest October forecast is slightly better at 3.2%. And we're seeing how that impacts on the different countries around the world. Some good news on the inflation front. We've seen an easing of oil prices with oil trading at 85 or $86 today. But this is WTI, West Texas International, the price is coming off the top. Equally with gas prices, Gazprom putting the squeeze on Germany and Europe. But they've come off the real highs uh, that we saw earlier in the year, but still <clears throat> historically high uh, compared to a year or so ago. Grain equally, the pressures on uh, grain prices has eased given the passage of products uh, out of the Black Sea to the rest of the world, and equally with copper, uh, some easing of prices there. And we've also seen this rapid decline in shipping costs. The crisis of shipping costs from China to North America has now eased significantly. And there's further good news because new container capacity, more container capacity, is set to come on stream next year. And there's even been some easing of the chip crisis that Nintendo has been fighting the chip crisis as more capacity has came on stream through the year and more is promised for next year. So what a world trade. We know that in 2021, world trade bounced back with 10% growth. That eased in 2022 to around 4.5% and is set to ease even further next year, next year to about 2.5%. So this pattern of uh, slowing world trade and easing the prices to a certain extent is going to ease the inflation outlook for the world and even for the UK economy into next year. In China, forecasts have been falling. We know that it was around uh, 2021, it grew about 8.1%, and now is expected growth of about 3.2%, which is down from estimates of nearly 5% growth early in the year. China at the moment grappling with the COVID crisis with its brutal, shocking tactics to try and contain the problems of uh, new outbreaks. <clears throat> and the IMF are warning that China's got to recalibrate this COVID strategy if they're going to see growth at even the levels, the, the reduced estimates at the present time. Do we still think China will overtake the US as the largest economy in the world by 2030? Well, maybe we're not so sure now. But nevertheless, it's still set to double in size by 2035 and beyond. And we must not forget, as we grapple with the challenges of Great Britain in the world, that the Asia-Pacific zone accounts for 35% growth. And here's a chart, here's a graph of you, anybody like geeky stuff. <laughs> this is the, uh, the US and China now account for half of the world's household wealth. So forget what's happening in the UK or what's happening in Europe. China and the US now account for half of the world's wealth. And that's why we think that uh, the new reserve currency will be uh, the, uh, the yuan, the renminbi, as it comes to play to challenge the hegemony of the dollar. So what are the USA? Well, here again, we're seeing growth forecasts lowered for this year and into next year, but not into a recessionary environment. And we've seen the unemployment rate quite low at 3.7%, as it is in the UK, <clears throat> and modest um, expansion of unemployment is expected over the next couple of years. And the inflation rate has hit 8% through this year. We'll look at the monthly charts in just a moment, <clears throat> and it's expected to slow to about 5.5% next year. When we look at the monthly pattern, you'll see why there's so much optimism in the US that the peaks may now have been hit. First of all, in consumer prices, 
which peaked at 9% in May, slowing to just under 8% in October. And that pattern is repeated in producer prices, which peaked at just under 12% in March, <clears throat> now slowing to 8% in October. So no wonder that uh, markets are optimistic about the direction of travel and so much speculation about how aggressive we'll have to be in the year ahead, especially into next year. Let's not forget, given the strength of the dollar this year, that the fundamental problems remain. A big internal deficit and also a big trade deficit, no matter what happened to the sanctions with China. So these twin deficit dilemma, internal deficit, external deficit, leads to this phenomenal 31.3 trillion dollar debt and rising. So what are the EU? Well, again, similar pattern in the EU with growth forecasts lowered. And it looks as if the ECB is slightly behind the curve when it comes to inflation, with the indications being that inflation is still set to rise, given the problems with gas specifically, and Gazprom putting the squeeze on Germany and on the uh, European states, that basically growth may forecast may well be lowered, and the Fed will be expect and the ECB will be expected to act to raise rates even higher. Each week now, we do our Friday forward guidance. We do our Monday morning market review and a Friday forward guidance. So we think that this is the pattern of the outlook for US base rates <clears throat> over the next year, peaking about 4.75% into next year. And in the UK, we expect base rates to peak at about 4.5% in the middle of uh, 2023. And similarly, in uh, Europe, where they're really behind the curve, and this estimate of 3.5% may well be too low. We know we've seen uh, market expectations of bank rate shut up when quasi Quateng was hijacked by the markets and possibly the bank and possibly the treasury uh, when he did his um, lavish budget. But now uh, estimates have come down to around uh, between 4 and 5%. And this is our summary of um, forecasts at the moment, which is up online on the website, and we update that every week it's not changing much at the moment so the big dilemma in the us is the markets are playing the fed how aggressive will the fed be how have we seen the worst of it well maybe we'll talk about that in a moment so i'm now going to focus on the uk and bear with me because i've been i've been trying to grapple with everything that's happened as paul said we've had four chances <laughs> in the last four or five months and we've had a couple of budget cracks at that so we're trying to digest what happened with um with the OBR forecast specifically. Bear in mind, if you're a new chancellor like Kwasi Kwarteng and you come into office saying, you know, you don't rate the Treasury, you don't rate the OBR, you don't rate the markets, you don't rate the bank, then everybody's going to stand back and say, well, have a go, pal, and see how you get on. So we are expecting, and to some extent, if I have my positive outlook uh, to play, we expect growth of 4.4% this year. Not so dramatic, really. Up in the top right, we saw growth of almost 11% in Q1 and 4% in Q2 and 2.4% growth year on year in Q3. Forget all those estimates of, well, don't forget, but put into perspective the estimates that growth was slowing into the third quarter. Yes, it was slowing, but the year on year comparison was still positive. And also, also bear in mind at the moment, because there's been so much drama in the data over the last couple of years, the poor guys who have to do the seasonal adjustments are really struggling because the disparities are so enormous with the pandemic shock and so on. So our benign forecast will be we see growth of 4.4% this year, which is almost uncontestable now, given the data we've already got. And we think there could be an outcome of about 0.5% growth next year. The OBR are much more negative. They see 4.2% this year and uh, shock to open to 1.4% next year. The bank are even more pessimistic they see almost 2%, 1.9% the shock next year. When we look at the forecast for the UK economy, at this stage, here we're just including the forecast for November from uh, about 15 major forecasters. They see growth well into negative territory with estimates of inflation next year, anything from 2% to 8%. So there's a lot of confusion about it. And when we look at the latest, um, you hear a lot about the global PMI, S&P global PMI data set. Uh, they're really in negative territory at the moment. I'm not so keen on that. It's more like a mood swing index uh, rather than a clear barometer of the direction of travel. Why is everybody so gloomy? Well, it's this incredible squeeze the OBR are talking about to household disposable income. Given the squeeze on real wages, 
uh, as inflation is above the level of uh, wage settlements and also the shock of energy prices plus some tax rises to feed into the equation. So the OBR is saying that the shock to disposal income could be uh, 7% over the next couple of years. Anyway, makes you wonder why we pay so much attention to the OBR forecast, really. They don't have a great reputation. But when you see the trend growth, this is what the OBR, the yellow line, where the OBR were projecting in March. And this is where they are in November with this shock to output and then a steady recovery. Compared to a trend rate of 2.1% prior to COVID, it means the output gap where we would have been had the world gone to swimming in according to plan, we've lost about 10% of output, which is worth about $200 billion pounds plus. And that means that's a tax take of almost 100 billion, which is now feeding into pressure on government borrowing. So let's see if the OBR forecasts are as pessimistic as the outturns emerge. Maybe not, uh, this could look too dramatic, but it certainly makes a, an incredible picture of the shock to output. And when we look at things like manufacturing, this is the long run trend since 1948. So there was a bit, a bit, bit of a setback in manufacturing at the moment, but as you see, according to trend, big setback in, uh, in, in the um, COVID crisis, then a big recovery, which overshot the trend, and that's adjusting at the moment. And that's feeding into some of the negativity about uh, growth at the moment, which would argue that maybe it won't be quite as bad uh, next year. Inflation. The annual average forecast about 9% this year and 8.2% uh, next year. So still a big inflationary burden. And when we see it month by month, these are the forecasts from the Bank of England in May, which thought it was going to peak at 10% and then rapidly drop. This is their estimate in November, peaking at 11% and then dropping quite radically next year. And if you look at the OBR figures, they're even more pessimistic, go optimistic. They say there's going to be uh, negative deflation, in fact, uh, but into 2024, the end of 2024. And if you believe that, then you believe anything. Uh, certainly, we, the, you know, the level of confidence we attach to OBO forecast diminishes by every 12 months added to the plan. Oil prices, we've seen oil prices come off the top. They're trading about 85, 86 at the moment. Uh, we expect them to average $95 through to the end of the year. But here's a chart for gigs. But that means the inflationary pressure from oil the red chart at the bottom diminishes by uh, the end of this year and into the first quarter next year. So there's still a big problems from gas prices, but oil prices means that the, de the deflationary impact will start to feed through into Q1 and Q2 next year, which is good news uh, for inflation. When we look at the bank base rate forecast, this is our estimate of where we see uh, base rates going um, and the OBR is slightly more pessimistic in which way you look, look at it, uh, they see rates peaking at about uh, 4 point, just under 5% in the third quarter of next year. And that looks to be highly demanding at the moment because the Fed are already signaling they're going to move by, still going to move higher, but not in jumps of 75 basis points now, which is what we envisaged in the plan. And the Bank of England already getting a bit nervous uh, with even now they haven't got a consensus vote, a full vote for um, for, for the rate rises that are being put into place. So again, the OBR looks a bit too um, um, negative, if you like, in terms of the uh, monetary outlook for base rates. I'm going to look at the labour market charts at the moment, and I've tried to put in some interesting charts on this thing because it's it's such a fascinating issue where we have 1.2 million unemployed, incredibly low, and 1.2 million vacancies in the economy. An astonishing phenomena, which we'll look at some of the uh, data for that. So we see um, at the moment uh, inflation or unemployment averaging about 3.8% this year, rising under one scenario to 4.2 and 4.4 in numerical terms. That means it's going to rise from about 1.3 million to 1.5 million uh, by 2024. That could well turn out to be a uh, slightly more pessimistic scenario, given the fact that we still have this incredibly high number of vacancies. And when we look at the ratio of um, the UV ratio, as we call it, from uh, unemployment to vacancies, you'll see it's hit this incredibly low figure, which is starting to pick up. But we still look at the disparity in the numbers. Here's a chart for geeks again. This is the amended beverage curve, forgive me at the moment. The big data set in the middle is actually the trend. And what we see is significant outliers generated by COVID, 
were vacancies were too low in the period May 2020 to December 2020. And now they're just too high compared to the reality of the markets between June 2021 and into September, the latest data at the moment. What we should see is for a given level of unemployment of 1.3 million, the level of vacancies should be more like 800,000 according to the base data. And this suggests that A, there are too many vacancies in the economy given the level of output, but B, also that this may well be a buffer which absorbs some of the unemployment shock as the economy slows down. Which sectors are most affected? Well, it's health and social, accommodation and food, retail, but also in professional services, manufacturing, and significantly still demands in construction. So <clears throat> what we see in terms of earnings at the moment is the red line is the trend rate of growth, about 3.5%. I've seen earnings pop up to 6% or 6.5%, uh, but we still expect that to average about 6% into uh, 2023 uh, and possibly slowing in 2024. The average earnings by quarter gives some of that data that it was peaking around 7.3% uh, in the second quarter mainly for statistical reasons. <clears throat> I'm not going to look at a series of charts because a lot of talk about where the jobs or what's happened to unemployment. And what we've seen is the employment dropped in 2020, given COVID, but then it picked up significantly to around 32.7 million, uh, according to the latest data we have, which is for Q3 uh, 2022. And what we have seen is the incredible drop in self-employment, which was about 5 million prior to COVID. And it's dropped to about four and a half or four point three million uh, in the latest data. So a lot of people, a lot of jobs left in the market were people who were self-employed, who presumably just gave up the growth, but gave up the ghost in terms of working for themselves. Uh, but also there's been a rise in economically inactive people, those who've just decided that they're gonna um, give it a call it a day and pack it in. A lot of speculation about immigration, you know, yeah. What we see is this is the employment pattern for UK citizens. Uh, bearing in mind, 20% of the workforce is the uh, non-UK citizens. This is what happened to EU citizenship in terms of employment in the UK of EU citizens. It peaked uh, in 2020 prior to COVID, but the trend rate of growth had that continued, did not come back after COVID. Had the trend rate of growth continued, it would have been 2.7 million compared to what is about 2.2 or even 2.3 at the moment. So almost half a million people left the UK uh, to go back to Europe and have not come back. And this has compounded the challenges for recruitment in health and uh, retail and all sorts of sectors. That's why the CBI are arguing for a relaxation of immigration controls. That's why Wolfson next, who was a great uh, passionate advocate of Brexit, is calling for a relaxation of immigration controls. And what we get is uh, Kant from the government uh, talking about the priority is illegal immigration. Yes, it is, a it is an issue to be dealt with, but the priority is trying to get these workers back into the jobs that we need in the UK. And what's happened is the non-EU uh, participation rate has just continued on trend. So big challenges there for governments. The dogma is divisive because it's preventing this relaxation of uh, rules. And of course, we've got uh, the Labour Party and Starmer arguing that he just wants to see higher wages for the, uh, for the for the workforce. OK, but that half million bridge will not be met anytime soon. A look at the autumn statement. Um, yes, a lot of credit went to Jeremy Hunt for what he was doing, but so much of it was back end loaded. You know, the pain was pushed back into um, 24, 25, and actually beyond into the next parliament, which a lot of people talked about. And when we look at the personal tax situation specifically, we can see that that is, yeah, sorry. I'm just, you know, yeah, when you see the personal tax burden, like, it makes you wonder why they place so much pressure on personal taxation increases at this time, creating so many bad points for the Tories and boosting the Labour Party polls because the reality is it only really comes into yield in two or three years time, presumably after the election. Of course, you got credit from the markets because of that. And equally in terms of the public spending, we've seen giveaways to the NHS and to education. 
Uh, but the real burden of uh, the increases comes in 25, 26 onward. This asterisk is what we call cuts as yet to be identified. It was a tactic that David Stockman, the budget director, Ronald Reagan used during his budget calculations. They couldn't balance the figures. So they just put in an asterisk and said, well, you know, these cuts will identify a bit later down the line. So it's going to be left to possibly the Labour Party to sort out how those deficits or cuts in, in, in um, government spending are made. And when we see the um, forecast in business taxes, and then they start to bite uh, slightly into next year, but bites into 24, 25. This is for the windfall tax, the energy profits level and the business tax. And what we've seen is this mythology of Britain becoming the Singapore of uh, Europe is just uh, the, we have seen this slide before for me, it's just that fantasy island for the treasury. And the party opposite, we have a plan. Yeah, I'm not sure he has a plan at the moment, which we'll talk about later. But when we look at borrowing, we all, it was estimated to be borrowing of 99, but it's one trend until the, after the September figures. Uh, but this has been blown away by interest payments that have been come into play. And we're seeing the estimates for borrowing drop from 99 billion was expected this year to a phenomenal 177 billion and 140 billion, then 84, then 77, then 80. A phenomenal increase in government borrowing and the demands on the gilt market. Why has that happened? It's happened because of the differences in the debt interest spending, but also the energy and cost of living support, which was 58 billion this year and 25 billion next year. So a big surge in borrowing primarily because of the debt interest spending, uh, where's that come from, and also the energy and cost of living support. And when we look at the forecast for borrowing, as I say, it goes to quite a phenomenal rise for uh, this year and into next. And when we look at public sector debt, that rises to about 2.8 well, trillion, say quickly by 24-25, which I've not seen the figures talked about, but that accounts to something like 107% to 106% in those couple of years as a percentage of GDP. Why did Kwasi Kwarteng get into trouble? Well, as I say, he came in challenging Treasury thinking, came in challenging the Bank of England's mandate, and disregard for the market, ignored the OBR, paid scant regard to the uh, gilt market, and he was punished because the bank now owns a third of the gilt. They stood back and let it happen a little bit. Overseas holdings, they, that's now just under 30% of the gilt market, they didn't like the trend of where it was all going. So when we look at the summary from the IFS, they say it's a worse public finance outlook. Yes, we agree with that. Taxes a share of national income is forecast to increase above 37% as a result of the latest uh, Treasury plan. Debt interest is now at its highest share of GDP in over 70 years. And debt is barely falling or barely on the falling path at all. And although we're squeezing, you know, uh, hadn't got the credit for squeezing the, the figures, actually, as the IFS says, it's Lord make me squeeze public service budgets, but not just yet. It's pushed into the Labour Party's lap, probably, the Conservative Party lap, possibly after the next election. So now we look at what of trade. This is the chart of where we think the deficit will be this year. Surplus in services maintained, top right corner, but the deficit trading goods <laughs> goes from 150 billion this year to over 230, to 230 billion in 2022. And that means the net trade deficit is about 80 uh, billion this year. And when we look at the, what's happening in trade, well, the deficit trading goods is increasing with the uh, both in terms of the EU and with the non-EU, and the deficits overall uh, means that you know, the trade balance looks bad as imports surge in, and uh, the the UK exports are still lagging in terms of the way they go. So a lot of ground we covered. I'm sure you've all got a lot of questions. I had a lot of questions to try and grapple with it, so it took me quite some time to try to understand what was being said and what was actually happening and also what was being interpreted uh, by the markets. So I'm just gonna wrap up now with a look at the market updates. A lot of questions about what's been happening to the UK markets. Well, we do our Monday morning market evaluation, and this is like a trend uh, momentum analysis that we do. We reckon that 
the US market specifically were nearly 30% overvalued at the start of the year in January. So it was expected that there be, and the European uh, markets not so much, maybe you know, FTSE at five and the DAX at nine uh, in terms of overvaluation, but Nikkei and the Asian markets were around, apart from Shanghai, around 10%. But this setback to the US markets was going to happen. And what we've seen is they've come off by, you know, take the NASDAQ by 34%, uh, Europe, uh, especially uh, France and Germany, down by almost 20%, and the Asian markets down about 10% on average. So they were overvalued. There was going to be a correction. There was a correction. It was a big correction. And where do we see it now? Well, bearing in mind, you know, we see that uh, the Dow is overvalued maybe a little bit, but great value, apparently. I am not licensed for the giving of financial advice, and uh, this data is available on the website. But the Nasdaq is then is an undervalued at the moment, we reckon, and Hang Seng specifically, and Shanghai equally. Those are the opportunities markets. If you've got the courage to beg against COVID and the changing policy of uh, the Chinese government, that's the summary chart we have on the website. We look at the markets every week. The pound trading at 119 when we did this, it's actually trading at 120, pushing 121 this morning. Against the euro, it's pushing 116 this morning. And, and the euro yes dollar will be up by 104. So we reckon that we've seen the trough in sterling and we've probably seen the peak in the in the dollar. And when we look at gilts, well, the gilt market was trading even lower, 10 year gilts down at about uh, 3% in the UK. So a big collapse, big adjustment to the UK gilt market from the days of quasi quatang and that shock to pension funds. We all discover new technology. I'm not sure we knew what LDIs were couple of months ago, but the shock to pension funds from LDIs has evaporated as gilt yields have reduced. And when we come to Sunak's d dilemma, you've got to say there's no tax strategy at the moment, an underlying tax strategy as to what's going on. There's no industrial strategy, which the CBI are complaining about. There's certainly no growth strategy, which is also what they've been talking about. There's no trade strategy, there's no immigration strategy, and there's no Northern Ireland strategy. And given the prospect of uh, the Scottish um, separation, then the problems could even get worse. So that's my summary. So in summary, as I say, UK recession, well, not yet, but we are braced for higher prices, lower growth, higher rates, and maybe we will be slipping, but it could be relatively modest setback for next year. So that's it. I've now un stopped presenting, as I say, and come back to the reality. Hope you're still with me. Hope you're still with me. How's Absolutely, that? John, we all are. We all are. Now, look, thank you ever so much for that. You you covered uh, an awful lot of ground there, John. I'll let you take a breath. Um, a lot of graphs and stats and insights as ever, but I think probably more than more than normal. Um, uh, quite a few questions. Oh, sorry, quite a few comments in the chat about kind of loving your visuals and things like that. And um, and so, you know, we have posted again just the link to um, John's website in the chat where you can see more of those. Um, I think one of these days, John, we should do a test at the end of this presentation to see if people have actually been listening or not. But uh, before you all dial off, I won't do that today. Um, don't worry, it's, uh, we'll, we'll take it easy. Um, what I would all ask you to do, please, and, and I can see that they're coming through, please do put your um, please do put your thoughts and comments in the chat. And we've got a few there already. Um, I'll kick us off with a question, John, and then I'll, I'll come to some of the ones we've had. John, John, you've got a wide range of people from different industries, different sectors, different businesses, different levels on this call. If you were sat in front of a CEO of a UK PLC this afternoon with such a wide range of variables you're talking about, and they're asking you what their outlook looks like and what they should be most worried about from a UK perspective, what top three things would you point them towards? Uh, yeah, well, that's that's a good question. I think it's difficult to to even pick out three because... The major challenges at the moment have still got to be coping with uh, the supply shock and coping with the challenges of rising prices. The extent of product elasticity and the extent to which those can be passed on is obviously critical. So from a supply and pricing point of view, that is one issue. A lot of challenges about recruitment and retention, understanding the motivation of the workforce, especially the younger workforce. So understanding what should be there in terms of, you know, you can't adopt the Musk model. Maybe everybody should adopt the Musk model. Of, how, of just firing everybody and asking them to come into the office and explain what they're doing. That doesn't really work. Not sure it works in the US, not going to work in Twitter, and it wouldn't work in the UK. But you know, supply side issues, pricing issues, uh, staffing issues, the challenge of recruitment, 
we would always go what we call condition red at this time, which would be, you know, you put a hold on recruitment, put a hold on replacement, you put a hold on capital expenditure. We went through a phase where we stopped any maintenance, including painting and decorating the offices. So it'd be all about taking caution because it's understanding where interest rate levels are going to go. And everybody should be modeling the impact of 4.5% interest rates, base rates with premiums on top of that in terms of, of what it will happen. So, you know, we talked about, we used to talk a lot about planet ZERP when it comes to interest rate policy. That what we've seen is return to what we would call normality with gilt yields should be about four to four and a half percent and base rates should be about four to four and a half percent. Uh, whether they'll get there and whether they'll stay there is one thing, but that should be modeled into every business at the moment. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I mean, just just a link to that. You, you highlighted that the UK has lost 10% of output on that kind of straight line trajectory. Moody's have downgraded us. Um, a lot of people here might feel that the UK has feared so much worse than other countries. Why is that? And how does the UK maintain its place on the world stage? Uh, well, I'm afraid you have to return to the dreaded issue of Brexit. Uh, when we talked about Brexit, we talked about four main areas of concern. One was political, one was social, one was economic, and one was business. And in terms of economic and business, we said, well, put those two inside because there is no evidence whatsoever to justify a Brexit move with a separation from Europe that would be damaging to the economy and it would be damaging to business. When it came to social, the issue was immigration. The population had been hyped up about immigration. And there we've seen the problems now that are facing the economy with the severe 1.2 million vacancies, half a million people who should be here from the EU or not. So the argument of uh, immigration, the social argument, uh, completely fallacious that is, as it was presented at that time. And then you can find the residual argument. The argument was who governs Britain? Is it anonymous bureaucrats in Brussels or posh speaking, cockney rhyming slang? Uh, for people in the UK, that who governs Britain? That's a great question. So with Brexit, I'm afraid, in terms of economics, in terms of political, in terms of social, in terms of business, that's caused incredible damage, which should be so difficult to unwind. And when you see the strength of the Chinese and the US economy, when you see that 35% significance of the Asian gap, when you see the opportunities presented by uh, staying within Europe, when you see the problems created by moving out of Europe, with the Japanese car manufacturers, the EV plants uh, going to, to Europe, then you'll see that's creating fundamental problems for the economy. And we've seen such a significant shock to output. So I'm afraid it's going to be a long grind, uh, given the stance we have at the moment. So no march of the makers. If the government do develop an industrial strategy, as Jeremy Hunt was promising, that will actually be the ninth industrial strategy platform in 12 years. And it shows the lack of see-through thinking uh, in government at the present time. So yeah, sorry to do the Brexit stuff, but you can't get away from it now. No, no, that's all good. Look, thank you for the questions coming through. I'll I'll um I'll start rattling through them, but please also feel free to put your hand up if you want to ask a question to John directly. Um, John, just just linked to what you were saying there about the you know, the role of the government. Just a question from Chris around that. To what extent can the government, the central bank? influence the macro economy, you know, such as reducing unemployment, inflation, promoting economic growth? Um, to what extent is it in our hands? Well, I, the, the, role of the, the role of the central bank is quite clear. Their mandate is to an inflation target of about 2%. And that's got to be the overriding objective. And that's got to be a good objective. So the bank must do what it must do to ensure that target is met and the evidence that they've been significantly lacking behind the curve in getting interest rates moving. OK, it's easy to say when you're not on the uh, on the committee, but that's the bank's remit. That's what they should do and get on with it. In terms of government, well, you know, there's so much that has to be done, but it's when you get policy ruled by, you've got to kick out the dogma. And if the, if the CBI are calling for lax immigration, then OK, let's relax immigration rules and get, get more workers into the UK. If the government, as part of the dogma, is saying we must abolish red tape from Europe and business is saying, look, it's not regulation, it's standardisation of the products and the product standards. We don't want to see this 
burning of uh, uh, European rules. Well, you've got to kick out the dogma and be pragmatic and uh, get talking with business and get understanding what is really required in terms of a platform for strategy. Uh, and you know, there's so much, so many problems they created with, with healthcare and in education and in social welfare that uh, they've got to get back to the basics. It's not difficult, but the dogma's got to go and the right wing dogma's got to go. And that's got to be a fundamental, you've got to be pragmatic and talk to business and construct the path for growth. There's no strategy for growth at the moment. So I love this next question from Kelvin. Um, John, you're, you're Prime Minister for the, and Chancellor for the day. What an honour. And maybe just today. Um, you can maybe last seven weeks or whatever, but what, what do you plan for the next year? It's in your hands. Yeah. What do you do? Well, you, I, the, you know, really, there's, there's so much that... It, I was once on a panel at, at the conference in Manchester, and, is, is a, and the, co the question on the floor is, when will you be our prime minister? And there's great amusement at that, but you know that's never going to happen. I, I, I think the agenda at the moment is horrendous because if you were, if you were, had um, presidential control and direct authority, then maybe you could do something. But at the moment, the Tory Party is riven with factions. You've got ERG, and you've got the hard Brexit years, and you've got those who really have the commitment to, to welfare, for example. There are so many issues which will not be addressed. When we talk about, for example, levelling up agenda, we have to accept that in terms of levelling up, the child poverty rate is 40% in Rochdale and it's 4% in Richmond. You tell me a strategy that's going to address that problem. And until we start to look at the issue of child poverty, then we won't understand how child poverty feeds into lacks education means lower industrial perform economic growth. It feeds into healthcare issues, which feeds adds the burden on the health service. It feeds to drug abuse. It feeds to alcohol abuse. So attacking child poverty is so fundamental, but we see nothing in government stance for five or six years now, even getting to grips with the problem of child poverty. So, you know, the issues are enormous and the problems of execution are even greater. So I would not... Uh, I wouldn't take up that mantle specifically, I'm afraid, at the moment. OK, it, it's interesting uh, to hear you it, 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 it talk about those things. You know, one thing you didn't mention there was intervention. Um, you know, and maybe before we get on to you know, one of the questions of kind of looking around at what, about what businesses can do to help buffer themselves. Just a question asked by Schofner, and you know, do, you, do you think the support measures that we've seen by the government are actually helping? Are they lip service? Are they just delaying the pain? That wasn't in your well, ministerial speech. So what do you what do you think? Well, when you, when you look at what happened with COVID, it was outstanding the, the way the government did step in in terms of the, the shutdown in the economy, but also the introduction of the furlough scheme. Because had that not been put in place, then the the, the unemployment levels would have been horrendous. I mean, it would have been really, really difficult. OK, they may well have recovered. But nevertheless, the government to step in with um, with the furlough scheme was quite significant. Now we had the energy crisis and the government stepped in to support in terms of the energy situation with this 40, 50 billion, 60 billion spend to support uh, household prices. But that kind of stuff can't go on to out forever. Or can it? Maybe it can. But I think the some of the intervention schemes are really uh, petty and small scale. So looks like we're going to lose the opportunity for electric vehicles. And also that's why, you know, a British vote is going to run into trouble because that gamble won't pay off. But when you take away the rationale for basing in the UK for the car industry specifically with no clear access to Europe, you know, why would the, the Japanese, for example, invest in the UK when they can equally invest yeah, in that, Europe and have direct access can. to the markets? Mm. So I think that, um, yeah, intervention, wow. small scale intervention, the government should address the issues of uh, OK, the fundamentals of education, healthcare, but also infrastructure spending on rail and on on road um, and on flood defences and on uh, new energy sources. That's where the money should be going, not small scale intervention to say about one plant here or another plant there. Okay. Very All opinionated right. this morning, aren't I? Very opinionated. I don't know what's going on. I'll forget <laughs> <many years. laughs> don't worry, we, don't worry, we're used to that. Um, you didn't. You also didn't mention about uh, you know, more borrowing. You know, you've mentioned about um, kind of Sunak's trillion dollar banknote before. Trust and you know, the question from Tony around trust and Kwarteng, you know, didn't 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 find 
a money tree, but got a money forest and got hammered by the markets. Do you think that means the era of limitless government borrowing is over? And what might and what impact is that going to have? Um, well, I think that, you know, as I was saying, with trust and quarting, they, they, they came to into office with a radical agenda and didn't pave the way, no sounding path. But it also, as I say, you know, they'd suggested the Bank of England remake was going to be changed, that they weren't happy with financial regulation in the markets. They weren't didn't need the role of the OBR for the forecast to support the forecast growth, weren't happy with the City of London. So if you come in with all that stance and you present an aggressive agenda that hasn't been really thought through or sold to read their own back benches, then you're going to run into trouble. And the cynics would argue that basically the bank stood back and the foreign investors stood back and let it happen. And the bank were embarking on this process of quantitative tightening, as we now call it, um, just as more demands were being placed on the markets. So, yeah, that was a problem of their own making. And I think they were hijacked as they wandered into the jungle, uh, saying that they weren't happy with the performance of the wild animals that got them into real trouble. So here, now you have a situation where the bank are embarking on QT. Why now? It can't be possible to do that because the demands on the gilt issuance is going to be so great this year and next year and for the years ahead. There's a lot of capacity for absorption uh, internationally with the gilt market. So we've seen that. Uh, um, investment going on in the US and equally it will continue in the UK. So there's not an end of an era. There may be a reversion to normality of 4.5% gilt rates, but uh, even that looks like it's uh, going to be some way ahead at the moment as the market's reversing to about 3% growth. So no, there were no, no change in the issuance issues, but the bank won't be able to dump the gilts that they've got at the moment. And I think the QT is going to be uh, slackened um, over the next couple of months. Well, look, you've given us your, your CEO message at the start. You've given us your prime ministerial and chancellor speech. Yes, Just going back to one of the first questions I think asked by Michelle, what are the key things then that businesses can do to ease their way through the next year? And then linked to that, what is it that consumers can do? Well, you know, from a business point of view, it's tough. It's always tough when things are really great. I remember in the late 80s, 88, 89, we thought, wow, this is fantastic. You saw the number of Jaguars increasing in the in the village in which I lived at the time. And business was just great. It was there to be enjoyed. But it was a short filled fantasy because the reality is for most businesses, it's a tough grind to get through uh, so many challenges that have to be faced. So you've got to do your scenario planning and you've got to do your uh, outlook for growth could be you know, maybe one half percent down next year or it could be a half percent up. And all that can mean for most businesses that doesn't mean a great deal in terms of impact. You know, if revenues fall by one or two percent, it's not you can easily absorb that. But it's a question of having that scenario plan as what could happen to um, uh, demand and the top sales line level, but also what's happening to the cost curve and also what's happening to um, to interest rates. So you really got to your model your interest rate scenarios, which incidentally the pension fund market did not do with their LDI strategy. So yeah, scenario modeling, examining the cost curve, make sure you're repricing, you have to reprice, make sure you've got your labor strategy in place and fundamentally look at your gearing and interest rate modeling. And also the problem is, as we see with government, when the top line drops, so often the cost line carries on increasing. And that's why we're seeing a radical adjustment in headcount levels in the tech sector at the moment in the US, not just in Twitter, but in Amazon, Google, and even Apple. So yeah, it's always gonna to be tough in business, uh, but you've got to do scenario modelling, examine your cost curve, look at your labour strategy and overall look at your gearing and fundamental challenges of higher rates, which could be here to stay. For households, well, it's again, it's going to be difficult because the challenges of energy prices specifically and this issue of eat or heat is going to be so critical and the risk of uh, unemployment also looms larger than it has done for a couple of years. Yeah, you... Just I mean, on reflection, you're, oh, yeah. you normally shower us with a little bit more optimism than that. But, um, you know, one of one of the optics and just picking up on a question asked by Steve is that, you know, you, some of the data you presented shows that maybe, you know, EU trends, particularly EU inflation, maybe UK inflation, you know, we're lagging the US by about six months. Do you see that? Should, should we should we be looking to the US or other markets as that indicator of where we're trending or are we, or are we just out of kilter? 
in the UK? No, I think I think it's always a good pattern to look at what's happening in the US because you know geographically the UK sits between Europe and the US, and if you look at the you know look at Sterling, don't think of Sterling as being a prime mover. It's really embroiled in that trilogy of the balance between what's happening, especially with the dollar and also with them. Um, with the Europe, but in terms of um, interest rate policy, yeah, the markets are watching closely what happens with the Fed. And in terms of um, interest, you know, the unemployment levels, the vacancy levels, challenges of recruitment, exactly the same in the US at the moment as they are in the UK. So we can learn a lot by watching the US uh, without being carried away as it being a clear predictor. But there's so much happening in the US that is the same problems in the UK. And fundamentally, you look at the world macroeconomic view that Russia may have dropped out the top 10 economies in the world, but the UK is still buzzing along there between sixth and eighth place, but it has no place to be on its own. It really um, would be extremely difficult to find those new mythical markets behind the magic wardrobe in the Snow White's Wonderland. Oh, I got my, I got, I got my fairy tales mixed up. <laughs> <there>. <laughs> I think so. But, it, but in terms of us navigating that, um, you know, and navigating that path for the UK. And Stephen highlights a point just saying, well, you know, are we are we pulling in different directions? So is the current independence of the Bank of England and its remit to maintain 2% inflation, is that counterintuitive to grow the economy? Is there a is there a tension there that we just won't be able to fix without some kind of jolt somewhere? Are they are they pulling in different directions? Well, I think the bank has a target of two percent, but it's pretty um, you know, it's pretty benign in getting there. So if you look at the 70s and the 80s, what in the 70s, inflation averaged about 10% and base rates were 5%. And then what we found is by the time you got into the second decade, inflation was around 10%, but base rates were averaging 10%. They had to adjust. So you've got currently inflation at 11% in the UK and base rates at 3%. That's not being globally aggressive to deal with the issue in everything that's still behind the curve. So I think the bank gets a lot of criticism. Uh, but it, they were in this magical world on planet Zerp, where rates were brought down to zero and even talk of negative rates. What nonsense was that? Now we're seeing a reversion to reality for uh, markets, in terms of guilt markets, and for um, central bank uh, interest rate level, interest rate levels, and fiscal policy, uh, monetary policy. So this is a return to normality. We shouldn't really worry about that. It's there to be well understood and well accepted. So the bank, yeah, get criticism, but their remit still stands. And they wouldn't go too aggressively, even into next year, according to the outlook at the moment. The real challenge is for a government to get its house in order. I think when you're into you know, this stage of a conservative administration where so many people have been in office and out of office, that you're not left with the pick of the crop now to choose from for your ministers. Sorry about that. Right, no, John, that, that makes a lot of sense. A lot, quite a, quite a few more questions coming through here. So I'm just going to do, do what I can just to get them to you. Housing, first of all, um, you know that's one of the topics we, you maybe didn't touch on as much. There's been a lot of speculation around that, a lot of you know speculation around collapsing in the housing market. Um, do you see that happening? Do you see that coming? I can't see it coming on the scale. That, you know, we, we, the headlines are there to 20 and 25 percent plus, which when you look at the small print in the forecast says in the worst case scenario, if the world were to come to an end and the economy dropped by 10 percent, then it could be that it has prices drop by 25. The fundamentals of the market are a shortage of supply, increasing demand, um, but there are issues of leverage in terms of especially with the cost of uh, mortgages rising as they, they are doing at the moment. So I think JL came up with a set of forecasts which were suggesting uh, that the <clears throat> average prices could drop by about 5% next year, but they're coming off quite significant highs anyway. But thereafter, it will kick back into year in the year after the, into 2024 20, and 25. So yeah, there's going to be some easing in the market because a lot of pain, uh, especially I think the bank estimated this like uh, 700,000 mortgages coming off fixed rates each quarter through next year. And that's going to be a big shock, which means that, you know, um, there is a big, big adjustment to being made there for a lot of households. So, yeah, some slowing in demand, some slowing in house prices, but no big setback. Yeah. And over the medium term, they're still be looking good. So no collapse. That's probably a relief to most people here. Um, 
couple of questions around kind of digitization. You know, one, one of the risks that we've called out in our own Fertility Top Risk Survey is around the risk of digitization, the impact that has on businesses. Kelvin's asked some question around the robots and automation um, trump a, a relaxation in migration when seeking to increase productivity. And, in, and indeed, you know, what's that, I guess, linked to that? What's that long term impact, do you think, of the increased desire to digitize and to automate? Well, you can't get away from the process of uh, digitization and uh, the growth of cloud and, and so on. So that's got to be continuing. Robotization is happening at pace, especially in terms of things of distribution in terms of manufacturing. That's already been happening. Talk of putting robot cleaners into the NHS. That looks to be a bit more speculative and doesn't quite promise to yield the same results. But there will be inevitable um, digitization, move to cloud, um, increasingly increasing auto automation, robotization, um, AI. We're not even touch on AI, where uh, big process and progress in terms of artificial intelligence. So yeah, these are all critical trends, but a lot of the basic stuff, you know, the robots picking fruit or the robots dealing with patients, that's going to be far more difficult. So big demand for labor will um, will will still be required, increased levels of immigration. And forget productivity. I, I think prog productivity is an output number. You have, you have the sort of growth uh, divided by, so output Y, as we call it, divided by L labor equals P productivity. Productivity is not a driver. It's a simple output of the arithmetic of output and labor intention. So, you know, increasing productivity, we'll see as we get higher growth. And at the moment, there's no strategy for growth. Okay. I'm going to test you now from one other particular market sector. Question from Steve around the IT security market to finish us off. Whether you have a view on this, his experience has shown the last 12 months that threats often increase in climates like this. So kind of cyber risk, resilience risk which in turn creates some resiliency in, in his particular sector. Do you have data around this? Do you see businesses collapsing? Do you see, you know, what's your view around, you know, the impact of IT security um, and the threat to the market for things like that? Well, I think the, 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 the we don't have a lot of data on it, but what we, what we do know is that uh, the, the sophistication is increasing in terms of the, the hackers and the, the, the fraudsters. So we've got to be ever more vigilant. And I think, you know, you've got to, in my case, I have three levels of email. So for different circumstances. So I have a high level for involving monetary issues, a mid level for private issues. I want to keep private and the rest is at risk of junk. So you've got to be more vigilant. And, and we hear scams so often about, you know, the letters coming in from a guy in Nigeria. It's this incredible opportunity, but on a broader scale, challenges to business. Uh, from fraud and so on. You've got to be so, it's got to be boom time for security guys because um, the level of, of fraud and sophistication of fraud is just increasing at an incredible rate. Absolutely. Um, John, that takes us to the top of the hour. Um, I'm very, very sorry if I didn't get to your question. I think I got to most of them. But look, if you like what you've heard from John today, um, please contact us at Fertility and Robert Half. We'll, we, we'll be delighted to carry on the discussion. John, Thank you so much. You covered so much ground there, and you know, so many. There's so many comments in the in the uh, in in the chat saying people, you know, like very much like what they see, and and the and the charts that have gone with that. If you like that, you can see more of that on John's website, the Saturday Economist, and all the regular updates he's mentioned. Um, there'll be a video of our forum posted today uh, on our website, so please feel free to share that with your friends and LinkedIn contacts. I hope that's been valuable to you all. Um, it seems so very timely to be doing this, and we, we, we will continue to do them, as I'm sure there's more economic turmoil to come. Thank you so much. On behalf of my Fertility and Robert's Half team here, we extend all our best wishes to you. Um, stay safe, be bold, be kind to each other, and we look forward to catching up with you again all very soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you for your questions.